what am I going to do this evening? I'm going to try to do the impossible. Um, <clears throat> in the old days, students used to have nothing very much to do at university. So they used to entertain themselves with pranks like, how many people can you fit into a telephone box? And it's going to be a little bit like that tonight. I'm going to see how many uh, ideas I can cram into whatever time is allowed me. I want to begin by talking a bit about the, uh, what I call the hemisphere hypothesis. Um, the, the, the question of the difference between the hemispheres, but mainly as a portal to a further exploration of reality. It seems to me that at the moment we're, we're puzzled about reality because um, there are messages that come to us, particularly from some areas of postmodernism, that there is no such thing as truth. Everything is just whatever you make up. I don't believe that for an instant. I believe passionately that there are truths. They are rarely simple. And they may sometimes conflict with one another. So it is hard to set up a program of them, but we can learn to look for them and be more successful in finding them. And it's in that project that I've been writing for um, 30 years. First, The Master and His Emissary, and then The Matter With Things, which came out a couple of years ago, or less than that now. November 21, and in it I try to take strands from what we know about the brain, what we know about our thinking patterns in consciousness, and what we know from physics. These seem like three pretty core ways of looking into the nature of reality. I'm not suggesting there is one single easy reality. I'm not suggesting there is one ever knowable truth. I'm suggesting that we mustn't ever give up on the idea that it is worthwhile for a human life. In fact, it is imperative for a human life to be searching for such a reality and such a truth. Otherwise, we are frankly deluded. And I believe that much of the world I now live in is suicidally deluded. But I'll come on to that <laughs> later. Now, let me see. Oh. That's good. So this is a quote from Pascal. The twofold nature of man is so evident that some have thought that we had two souls. Well, he's not the only person to have said something like this. Kant said something like this, Schopenhauer, um, Bergson, Goethe, Nietzsche, the wonderful German philosopher Max Scheler, who in my view is underrated and under. Uh, read these days, they all had this instinct that there were two sort of almost people or points of view within us that were somewhat in conflict. Each could be helpful for some things, but neither of them was complete in themselves. And in fact, incidentally, in writing this book, I found that there are stories like the story of the master and his emissary, which gave me the title of my earlier book, 2009, from all around the world. The story I took there was supposed to resituate the way in which we think about the left and right hemisphere. When I was in medical school, it was said that the left hemisphere sort of was terribly important because it controls the right hand with which you do the grasping. And it controls certain elements of language, mainly speech, through which we say we grasp things. But actually, it turns out that the right hemisphere is far, far more important for getting a hold on the world than the left hemisphere. And indeed, when people have had a stroke, it is harder for them to recover from a stroke in the right hemisphere than a stroke in the left hemisphere, even though the left hemisphere stroke often affects their speech and affects their um, ability to use their right hand. So and, uh, it, it, I could say at this point that in the, in the later book that I'm, I've written, The Matter With Things, which came out, as I say, November 21, I begin by looking at what I call the various portals through which we can um, get a grasp of the world at all, get some kind of understanding of it, receive information from it. And I take it that those are attention, perception, which is not the same as attention, judgment, the ideas we form on the basis of what we attend to and what we perceive, emotional and social intelligence, cognitive intelligence, in other words, IQ, 
and creativity, because that enters into our ability to interpret what it is we're seeing. And in all of these, I demonstrate at length over 400 pages, and I draw on 5,600 pieces of research I can demonstrate conclusively that all of these are better carried out by the right hemisphere. It is more veridical, it is more intelligent, more perceptive, and much better guide to reality. And when people have right hemisphere damage, this has been commented on by neurologists over the least a century, they lose any sense of reality, they become deluded, start hallucinating. And indeed in schizophrenia, which is the, the topic that probably rings bells for most people when one mentions delusions and hallucinations. What is going on there is something like a defunct or deficient right hemisphere, which has been compensated for by an overactive left hemisphere. Anyway, that's all by way of an introduction. But first of all, let me just ask this question. Most of you here will have heard something like this. What, hemisphere differences? That's all complete rubbish. That was all blown out of the water 30 years ago. It's all nonsense. Don't even listen to it. And there's a sort of circular thing that happens here. This is what people were taught. So they never looked. Because they never looked, they never found anything different from what they've been told. So much later in their careers, they don't want to spend 30 years like me actually finding out what are the differences between the hemispheres, because it would mean the end of their career, they'd be despised by their colleagues, they wouldn't get promotion. So I'm afraid this is a question of a, an, what you might call an urban myth. It is an idea that itself needs powerfully to be debunked. If you don't believe me, read my work. It is enormously well referenced. You can look up everywhere what it is that I'm referring to and why it is scientifically based. I'd just like to ask you three simple questions. Why is the brain divided? This is a picture by Vesalius. And we were in Basel the other day and passed by accident a house. It said, here lived Vesalius. So in 1542, this slightly grumpy looking man had the top of his head lifted off. And here you see the left hemisphere pushed slightly to the side to expose this van der fibers at the base of the brain called the corpus callosum. Why is the brain divided in this way? If the power of the brain is in making connection, connections, why have it so massively divided? And it's not just our brains, by the way, it's all the brains we've ever looked at. Mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, right down to insects having separate different ganglions. Wherever you look, and in fact, in the oldest creature that we know has a, a neural network, which is said to be the ancestor of the mammalian brain, uh, a sea creature called Nematocella vectensis, the brain is, the neural network is somewhat divided and asymmetrical, which is the next thing I'm coming on to. Why is the brain asymmetrical? Here you're looking up at the base of the brain, as if you were looking up your own spinal column, and you can see that the right hemisphere, which is helpfully on the left, is um, larger than the, uh, the, the corresponding frontal lobe of the left hemisphere. And similarly at the back, the left hemisphere is larger than the right. When I was in medical school, that was always said to be because of language, but we know it has nothing to do with language. It has become used by language now that the brain has this expansion, but the expansion was not caused by language because it's there in chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and other creatures that we've tried to teach language to and got nowhere. And the third thing is the corpus callosum itself, this band of fibers, which only 2% of brain fibers actually cross from one hemisphere to the other. It's rather wonderful, this suburban doorbell suddenly coming in from the cosmic <laughs> reaches. Um, what I've got here is a normal human brain uh, over, whoops, there. Ooh. And over here, I've got, I was very privileged, I got a slice through uh, Donald Trump's brain. And, um, oh no, sorry, it's a dog's brain. Uh, but anyway, what you see is that um, the dog's brain is uh, smaller than a human brain, uh, quite a lot. But the corpus callosum, which is, if I can do this, this whoa, band of fibers here, and the same thing in white over here in the, whoops, in the, <laughs> there. The job I didn't have a drink. And so the, the, you can see that it's, it's not as big 
um, comparatively with the brain. So the, the corpus callosum is getting smaller over evolution, and it only started in mammals. Prior to mammals, there wasn't a corpus callosum at all. And get this, the main purpose of the corpus callosum is to inhibit, to tell one hemisphere to, to the other one, keep out of it. Um, many of the fibers that cross the corpus callosum, for those of you who are neuroscientists, are uh, excitatory, they're glutamatergic, but they abut on GABA, Ergic neurons, which are functionally inhibitory. And that, uh, why this might have a, re ooh, a reference to human culture is uh, expanded in this book, The Master and His Embassy. Why would this have anything to do with human culture? Well, I'm going to explain to you that the two hemispheres have evolved to do completely different things. And in this book, I go into that and the philosophy of it, but I also look at the history of human culture and suggest that there are times when we have got these two aspects of our brains out of balance. Uh, I'll come on to that. Now, uh, as was mentioned by Amir, a central concept for me is attention. When I discovered that one of the most important distinctions between the two brain hemispheres was the way in which they pay attention to the world, it didn't immediately dawn on me why this was so significant, because I had been trained in a mechanistic way of thinking about the brain, which was that attention is just another cognitive function that can be measured in the lab, and it could be simulated by a machine. A machine can be directed towards something, but it can't pay attention to it. And attention is something very special indeed, because I believe it actually creates the world. The only world that any of us can know is the world that comes into being for us. And that world is a combination of something coming from us and something out there. And I believe that this is a two-way relationship. In fact, that all things in the cosmos have two-way relationships, are reverberative in their nature. And I'm trying to get away from naive realism on the one hand and naive idealism on the other. Naive realism I call rot, that the reality is out there, R-A-T. And that's just nonsense, that there's just a world out there and we record it passively like a photographic plate or a sound recorder. No, part, something of us goes into what we find there, which is why what we find there has some very general common ground, but is not identical in every experience, even by the same person, never mind by different persons. But I also don't think that it is um, uh, what you might call mumbo made up miraculously by ourselves, M-U-M-B-O, which is the kind of postmodern idea that it's just a fantasy out of our brains. It is something that happens between, in what I call a betweenness. And a betweenness is not just a gap between. It is it's like an electric current. Where is the electric current? Is it in the positive terminal? No. Is it in the negative terminal? No. It needs them. Is it in the space between? No, it's in the whole ensemble. And between this is what happens when two things come into a new union and something uh, comes about that is different from either of any of its uh, component parts, uh, but subsumes them. So they're necessary, but not sufficient. Now, this is the mountain behind my house. Its name derives from a Norse word, which means a sloping rock. And you can see why, because from the sea, this mountain was a signal to the Vikings who came there um, a thousand years ago that this was a very dangerous bay in which they would be shipwrecked. So to them, this mountain was a landmark that meant life and death. But there were people here before the Vikings. There were the Picts, and they've left their brochs, their stone houses. And we know that for them, this mountain was the home of the gods. Then in the 18th century, people came to draw and paint in Scotland. It's a very beautiful landscape. And they would have seen this as a many-colored, many-textured form of beauty. And then in the 19th century, people came and they were interested in geology. And it just happens to be an extremely good example of columnar battle formation. Um, so to the, all these people, it was something different. And then to a physicist, you ask a physicist what it is. Well, 99.99% of it is... We, empty space, and the other bit, the 0.01%, we don't really know what it is after all. So which of these is the real mountain, I ask you? Now, my answer to that is 
that no one of them is the full story, but each of them is the real mountain. Each of them is a real way of looking at the mountain. And if you say to me, yeah, but come on, it's just a big lump of rock. That already is a very specialist way of looking at it, which betrays your values and your particular narrowness of way of viewing, because it's many, many things. Now, if you apply that across the world, you realize that attention is a creative act. Attention is a moral act, because what you make of the world is something that really comes out. When I attend to you in a certain way, I can, I can bring something that is warm, good, beneficent, perhaps healing, um, as a good therapist or doctor might be able to do. If I pay attention to you in a clinically detached way, I can make you feel very small, very alien, and so on. We create the world around us. We actually make things through our attention. So how you attend matters because it forms up like this. Once you start looking in one way, you find only the bits of the world that respond to the way you look. The world is a machine. So you look at it, you find this is mechanical, that's mechanical, the other's mechanical, the whole thing's a machine. <laughs> but that's because looking at it as a machine, all you see are the bits that respond to that mechanistic view. And if you do, you then start to look further in this same way, thinking that was a good start. And now you just harden up. So after a few decades, it's very difficult to break out of a habit of mind that we are instilling into people in the West, which was never held at any other time in human history, never held in other parts of the world and the West until very recently, and is extremely odd. This is the kind of attention paid by the left hemisphere, targeted on something. The reason that we have these two hemispheres, you may say, why do we have these two hemispheres? Is because the left is good at one thing only. It's much better than the right at grabbing, at grasping. And it even the processes that it, whereby we say we have grasped something, we have uh, begriffen or, or uh, indeed comprendre, comprendre, comprehendere is to grasp hold of, or uh, apprehend is to grasp onto. Comprehend is probably different. It's to sort of see the whole together, which is what the right hemisphere alone can do. But this is how the left hemisphere looks at the world. A leads to B, job done. But the broad view of the right hemisphere sees that A and B are connected, but not as directly as you thought, and that the system is living, hence the birds and the tree, and complex, not just complicated. Uh, you may say it's very facile to talk about one hemisphere as a whole, and of course, I am neurologically trained, I'm psychiatrically trained, I know that there are different areas in the brain, I know they have different functions, if you read my writing you will find that the different areas do, but it is also now known that instead of thinking modular in a modular way about the brain, we should be thinking more in terms of whole networks, and indeed the, 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 when you excite one part of, a certain, of the left or the right hemisphere, there will be excitations that spread much more widely throughout that hemisphere. And this is to show you a couple of sort of, um, if you like, the super highways of transmission, the superior longitudinal fasciculus and the unsonate fasciculus showing connections between the posterior part of the brain and the frontal lobes and between the frontal lobes and the temporal lobe. So um, this pains me, I'm going to do something, it's extremely simple minded and much more black and white than I would like it to be, but because I just don't have time, you'll have to take it as a bit of a caricature, but broadly speaking, uh, it is what you can accept. And if you want to know the finesse and all the details, then read my books. So um, there are various differences. And one is that the, the left, I put the left hemisphere version on the left and the right hemisphere version on the right. And in these dichotomies that are somewhat false dichotomies because nothing can be cut and dried when it comes to anything as complicated as the brain. But nonetheless, there are strong tendencies for the right hemisphere to be able to apprehend new experiences of whatever kind, new music, new person, new shape, whatever it might be. Whereas the left hemisphere latches onto what is already known and familiar because it's looking for food. It's looking for things to pick up with its right hand. Um, and in, it, the evolutionary point here is that if you're only attending to food, 
and a twig to build a nest and all the utilization of the world, the manipulation of the world, which the left hemisphere is good for, you'll soon be eaten by another creature while you're getting your own lunch because you need to be looking out for predators, for your mate, for your conspecifics. And so you have to have some part of your brain that is holding the whole picture together while you go about grabbing and picking what you know. It prefers what is certain to what is possible. In other words, it likes things to be cut and dried, black and white, whereas the right hemisphere is more open to uh, ambiguity. Uh, the left hemisphere prefers fixity. It, can, it likes to fix things, and literally when people have a certain kind of damage to the right uh, posterior hemisphere, they begin to see normal flow of motion broken up into do, 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 like a sort of um, a, 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 an old fashioned cine film that's got stuck or stop go animation. Because after all, it's targeting something and wants to catch it. So it fixes it and picks it up. So it sees a lot of static bits, whereas the right hemisphere sees that everything is flowing. The left hemisphere sees parts where the right hemisphere sees the whole. The right hemisphere has the body image in it, which is the whole image of the body in all modalities. The left hemisphere has a nose, an elbow, a knee, a foot. Explicit versus implicit. So the left hemisphere understands what is explicit. What if you have a dictionary and a grammar and perhaps a computer could put them together, but all that is implicit, which is nine tenths of what matters to us, things like love and a sense of the sacred and the meaning of music and the understanding of poetry, the understanding of humor, uh, sarcasm, irony, all these things that change the way the world is to be interpreted are taken at face value by the left hemisphere, though understood by the right. The left hemisphere tends to abstract things from their context. And if you take things out of their context, they change their meaning completely. And the best way to understand something is to see it in the context, which makes it what it is. Nothing is something outside of its context. The context is what actually creates it, which is one of the reasons I say that relations are prior to things. The title of my later book is The Matter with Things, which is a pun about our obsession with matter and our obsession with things. But things, I say, arise secondarily out of a web of relationships. They're the things that catch our attention. They are the, the, the little hubs where things cross, but actually they are only what they are because of their relations. In abstracting, it turns uh, whatever it has into a general case, not a unique one. And here, because I'm in Switzerland, this is the first time I've ever talked about this, are two wonderfully described cases, rather sad cases. One is of a woman who spent her whole life um, describing and writing about the birds of Switzerland. And you have a wonderful bird life here in Switzerland. And she had a, a right uh, posterior uh, temporoparietal stroke, and afterwards, she said, all the birds look the same. This is pretty tragic. And another is a case of a farmer, a Swiss farmer, who knew all his cattle by name. But after a stroke, he had it difficulty telling a cow from a horse. So you see, it deals in very broad categories. But the right hemisphere sees the unique case, sees the you-ness of you and the, the thisness of your friend. The left hemisphere is mainly interested in how much of something, the right hemisphere more in, but how, what is the quality of it? Naturally, this world becomes inanimate and the right hemisphere sees the animacy. And you can actually isolate one hemisphere at a time, painlessly, experimentally using something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And if you, if you suppress uh, the right hemisphere, people see what they would normally think of as living as inanimate. And if you suppress the left hemisphere, they see things that we would normally think of as inanimate, like the sun, as a living being. The left hemisphere is remarkably optimistic, ridiculously optimistic. You, again, you can isolate one hemisphere at a time, and this is done sometimes prior to um, brain surgery. 
uh, and it's called the WADA test. And while one hemisphere is isolated, the other one is not contributing, it lasts for about 15 minutes. During that time, <clears throat> some psychologists administered a personality inventory to the subject and also to the subject's relatives and friends and discovered that the left hemisphere has a very high opinion of itself compared with what other people think. But when it was the right hemisphere's turn, the right hemisphere was a little bit too negative about itself, but more realistic. And the most extraordinary um, demonstration of this is denial. This is terribly important because I believe we now live in an age of denial. All around us, we are denying a whole host of things, trying to not see them at all or saying the opposite is the case. And this is very literal. After the left hemisphere stroke, somebody may have a paralyzed right arm or right leg, and they'll be very unhappy about this. They will weep about it, complain to the doctor. But if they've had a stroke in the right hemisphere and the left side is paralyzed, they may completely deny there's anything wrong. So you're going to see them in the morning after they come in with a stroke in the night and say, how are you? And they say, fine. I say, oh, that's very good. And any difficulty moving anything? No, no. Can you move your left arm? Yep. Can you show me? And they go there, but nothing actually moved. And if you bring it round in front of them and say, move that, they say, that's not my arm, that belongs to that person over there. Well, it belongs to you, doctor. And the, the most important, but least exciting perhaps of this list is the difference between something that is truly present and something that is represented. Now represented literally means presented again after it is no longer present. It is therefore already past, finished, dead. And Presenting is something that we don't allow the world to do nowadays because we're so quick with our representations. Oh, it's one of those. It's a picturesque scene. It's a lake. It's a car. It's a whatever. We don't, only if we practice mindfulness, are we able to get back to that um, state in which we are fully present and the world is fully present to us. Okay, that's because I didn't know how to build that slide. <laughs> Hello, yes, we've heard from you before. Now, so um, effectively what you've got here, I, I'd like to draw this together so you see the kind of world that the left hemisphere brings into being for us. It's effectively, I think we may have more problems with my poor skills at building slides, but let's see. Ooh, that's all right. So um, first of all, you've got a world in what we take for reality. Better? Does it check the pack on? Yeah, yeah. Has it stopped working or? Well, I, I, it's been very quiet all along. I, I'd have liked it to be louder, but yeah, I'm not a technician. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to sit at something? No, I'm fine. Oh, that's better. That's a bit too much. Yeah. Thank you. Aha. Thank you. So, first of all, what we take to be reality is, in fact, just a representation, a map, a picture, a diagram, but not the complex living whole. One that is, in fact, made up of isolated things, things, moreover, that are known, familiar, decontextualized, fixed, predetermined, and made up of bits, fragments, disembodied, having no meaning or coherence until we give it to them, where all is abstract, generic in nature, infinitely reproducible and quantifiable and therefore inanimate and mechanical. And the future is a fantasy which would be only better if we could get more of it under our control. Whereas in the right hemisphere, one sees that nothing is ever entirely certain or predictable, that all things are ultimately interconnected, that there is nothing that is ever fixed, but in fact that, as Heraclitus said, everything flows. That what exists are holes, the parts are an artifact of the left hemisphere's way of looking at it. 
that meaning is implicit, uh, that the world of uniqueness is real, not just categories that can be quantified, but having different qualities, and an essentially animate world. And here there's a future that is a product of realism, not denial. We've got one hemisphere that sees just a, a theory of the world. It's very simple and pleasing and is only going to get better. And the right hemisphere is seeing the whole embodied, impassioned business of vitality and seeing that it is not necessarily leading somewhere we want to go. And there is a relationship between the brain and the structure of the cosmos. Um, that's something I'm going to try and explain now. Um, there is a sort of hierarchy of the right and left. Let me say this first of all. I think I've explained that the right hemisphere is more veridical, that it is a better um, transmitter of, producer of reality, and the left hemisphere has certain limited uses. What it sees is not wrong. It's not that it's got no use. It's just that its use is very limited and its knowledge is limited. The problem only becomes when it thinks it knows more and we pay attention to that very narrow way of thinking as though it gives us the full picture, which it doesn't. So there's a hierarchy there. And I think this is also demonstrable in physics. I'll, I'll explain that. And I, I would say that when we're talking about, you know, how we would like to make a world, it's a fantasy for us to imagine that we can just make up a world without understanding both our own brains and the cosmos. And so this is where we need to start from in all our exercises of imagination. Um, in whatever exists, there is a replication of this thing about the brain, which is that the left hemisphere tends to divide in order to understand, but then cannot put it together again. But the right hemisphere tends to see the whole and see the whole picture of which what the left hemisphere has been looking at is just a part. Now, we need both these kinds of attention, but one of them is more important than the other, the capacity to see the whole. And there are these forces for division and forces for union throughout the physical cosmos as well as the metaphysical one. And what we need is the unity of the forces of division and union, not the division of the forces of division and union. Do you understand? I sometimes say we don't want either, either or, or both and. We need both either or and both and. I hope that's entirely clear. Um, so this idea of hello? the unity of difference and unity is the first asymmetry. The cosmos is founded on asymmetry. Um, so this is all played out in this recent book of mine in two volumes, 1,300 pages of text, 1,500 altogether. Um, now, it's based on this idea that science and philosophy should never have been divorced. The word science in English only began being used to specialized meaning in 1830. Until then, science meant knowledge. And in, indeed, what we call science is called natural philosophy, because in fact, what scientists don't see anymore is there is no such thing as just looking because the way you attend, the preconceptions with which you attend, alters what you find. If you don't know anything about philosophy, you just think it's obvious that everything is mechanical because that is the philosophy of our age. That is what people suck up from all around them as they grow, that everything is mechanical, but it is not actually mechanical. Organisms in particular are not like machines in at least eight ways, which I explain in this book. And here I'm quoting from my favorite English philosopher of the last hundred years, the antagonism between science and metaphysics is like all family quarrels being disastrous. And from Collingwood, science and metaphysics are inextricably united and stand or fall together. Uh, any of you who here are scientists, please take that away and think about it. It does matter. Um, and w one of the things that I wanted to talk about was the centrality of attention 
uh, to what comes into existence. I've talked a bit about that already. Then the coincidence of opposites. Now, to our way of thinking now, how can opposites coincide? It sounds impossible. We're taught at school that if it's this, then the opposite is as far away from it as possible. But this is not the case, actually, because mental space, metaphysical space, and indeed physical space is curved. It's not linear. And the further you go in a certain direction, the more you find yourself coming back to what you were running away from. It's a truism that anarchy leads to tyranny, that, that something extreme gives rise to its opposite because it has its opposite hidden in it. I've always thought that politicians with extreme left and extreme right, you can hardly get a razor blade between them. They've got the same mentality, which is to miss all the shades, the complexities, the subtleties of human existence. Um, and uh, I, I've already mentioned that I believe that relations come before relata, the things that are related. And then I just want to say something about limit cases being inverted. This is my view of reality that, you know, in the old world, in the old world of physics, we thought that this was a Newtonian world, that things are naturally static and they don't move unless they're given a push. But now we know that there is nothing that is actually static in the entire cosmos. Everything is in motion. And stasis would be the limit case of motion, not motion, the limit case of stasis. Representation is the limit case of what is actually real. Total independence is the limit case of interdependence because everything is interdependent. There is no such thing as total independence, but if it existed at all, it would be the limit case of the norm, which is interdependence. Discontinuity is not the norm, which then gets connected. Continuity is the norm. You may say, how, why do you say that? I can quote physicists who say this. Metaphysically, I believe it to be the case. From observation of the world, I believe it to be the case. But discontinuity is the limit case of the continuous. The explicit is not the norm and the implicit, some very strange thing that happens in a poem. Implicit is what all our knowledge is. Explicit knowledge is a very special case that we learn how to say in words through the process of um, uh, education. The literal is the limit case of the metaphorical. Everything is metaphorical. Everything, even the words, in fact, particularly the words used by science and philosophy, a point that has been made by philosophers themselves, are based on metaphors because they're dealing in an abstract realm and they therefore have to draw things from a real world. In fact, the word abstract is itself something that means being dragged away. I mean, it's very physical. Um, so meaning is effectively metaphorical and the literal is only a special case of the metaphorical in which you privilege one kind of meaning. Randomness, which actually doesn't exist anywhere in the cosmos, would merely, if it existed, be the limit case of order, which is everywhere. Simplicity represents a special case of complexity, because the more you go down, even into the, into the, uh, the, the, the quantum vacuum, this is the simplest thing that we know. And according to David Tong, professor of physics at Cambridge, it's unbelievably complex. So simplicity is what we make when we clear away all the complexity. And go, ah, I've got a mechanism. How lovely. That gives me a little tweak power. Um, the determinate is the limit of the indeterminate. Everything is actually ultimately indeterminate, but in very special cases, if you take the window narrow enough, you can say it looks determinate. And straight lines are the limit case of curves, not curves, some special case of straight lines. So all that exists is a kind of form. And in the words of Whitehead, beyond all questions of quantity, there lie questions of pattern, which are essential to the understanding of nature. And form is a matter of tension. Um, can I go back? Yes. This is from my favorite pre-Socratic philosopher, Heraclitus, or my favorite philosopher, frankly. They do not understand how a thing agrees with variance, at variance with itself. It is an attunement turning back on itself like that of the bow and lyre. What did he mean? He meant that things are always in balance of their opposites, that wherever something exists, its dark side, the other end of it is there as well. 
And that what you look for is not to collapse this creative tension into just this or just that, but to hold the tension. For us, this is uncomfortable. Therefore, we try to collapse it. Oh, it's just that, or it's just that. No, you have to hold the two opposites. And the bow and the lyre is the string of the bow, the string of the lyre gives rise to the note, that gives rise to the flying arrow. And if you let that tension go slack and didn't pull in two opposite directions, pulling in opposite directions is logically a waste of time. But actually, it's essential to everything that exists because this tension is creative. You want to make a good apple pie. You don't get boring, bland apples. You get nice tart apples and put lots of honey with it. And this is one of his deepest sayings, graspings, which means the coming together of things, holes and not holes, convergent, divergent, consonant, dissonant, from all things one and from one thing all. I would love to have time to unpack that for you, but take it away <laughs> and read it and think about it. And that relates to the idea of one and all. I have a chapter on the coincidentia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposites, and a chapter on the one and the many. And I say it is wise, or he says it is wise, listening not to me, but to the Logos, which is like the founding ground of being, to agree that all things are one. And I put in brackets, and that the one is all things, because the Greek grammar allows this ambiguity of dual interpretation. As I say, he also, and this is the second important point about physics, is that everything flows. That's not the same as everything changes. There is a Buddhist saying that everything changes. It's good as far as it goes, but everything flows is better because not only does it suggest that there's a difference between the meaning of flow and just a succession of things, but also it contains within it the important idea that when things flow, they both are different and the same. The river that flows by my house is always the same river, but the water is always different. And Heraclitus said famously, you can't step into the same water twice. Um, but that is beautiful because he also said by changing, things remain the same. See, this very interesting idea that comes from observing the flow, that in the flowing it remains what it is, but it also becomes something other. Then here is Demo Democritus, another early Greek philosopher. The cause of coming into being of all things is the vortex. The vortex, of course, is a whirlpool. And this is terribly important because, uh, well, this is about flow, really. Um, this is David Tong again from Cambridge. At a fundamental level, nature is, is nature discrete or continuous. I see no evidence whatever for discreteness. All the discreteness we see in the world is something which emerges from an underlying continuum. Quanta are emergent, they're not built into the heart of nature. So there we need discontinuity and we need continuity, but continuity trumps, if you like, discontinuity. It, it is able to overarch the two. And here is the vortex. And there's various interesting things about the vortex. First of all, if you look at a whirlpool in a stream, a whirlpool is photographed or measurable. It can move stones. Is it in the water? No, it's not in the water, like the stone is in the water. It is the water for that moment. It is that water. And I believe that beings, including every one of you here, if you think about your nature and your being, you are like this whirlpool in that you are not distinct from whatever it is that constitutes us, a sort of indigestible lump. You are from something that is already there that takes the form you take at the moment. And when you go, it will be passed on and will still be part of the flow of the river. So there are various things about vortex. One is that it has the nature of a spiral, as you see. And spiral staircases are very important because they are a good image of how we progress in life. T.S. Eliot said that the end of all our voyaging is to return to the point where we started from and know it for the first time. But that's not actually true. We don't ever return. We can't ever return to the point we started from because it's gone. We come back somewhere higher on the spiral and look down at where we had been before. But nonetheless, the progress is in one sense, circular, but is also upward. And this is uh, Jacob's Ladder as depicted by the poet 
and painter, William Blake, romantic poet and painter. And it's the only Jacob's Ladder I know which shows it not as a straight line to heaven, but as a spiral that climbs in this way forever. And this is really just to say, if you look at a spiral down its axis, you see a perfect circle which is static and eternal. But if you look along the side of the spiral, you see that it's actually a, not a particle, but a waveform, and that it is extending somewhere in space. It has linearity and circularity, recurrence and newness uh, in one. And this is just to show that in flow, there is always movement which is reciprocal. That's one of the things that uh, flow gives rise to. Um, and these are rather interesting. These are photographs taken of the flow uh, in water. And what has been done is simply a, a straight line of uh, rectangular uh, rods that are rectangular in cross section immersed in the stream. So absolute rigidity, straight, straight pieces, bars in a line. And what you get is this completely wonderful creative newness which flows and changes. Um, this is something called the uh, Kalman vortex, vortex Street, which is created by an obstruction uh, simply stuck into the flow of water. And it results in this amazingly beautiful form, just suggesting that flow and the obstruction of flow are creative. In my philosophy, resistance to flow is as important as flow. Resistance is creative. Without resistance, nothing can happen. What is friction? It's what stops movement, but it's also what starts movement. Without friction, I can't take a step. So these things come together in this way. And this is from Leonardo. He's showing an old man leaning on a stick in the water. And there he shows the patterns that follow, which he describes as like braided hair coming from the stick. And the most beautiful ratio uh, on which many aesthetic um, uh, figures and uh, pictures and so on are based is the so-called golden section, which is asymmetric. It has this interesting asymmetry built into it. And this is just to say that each of those rectangles is in relation to the next rectangle in the uh, uh, ratio of one to 1 1.61, which is roughly speaking that of the um, golden ratio. And it relates to a spiral. Here you can see the generation of the spiral out of it. This spiral is again part of the asymmetry of nature and the both going uh, forward from something but completing something at the same time. These are snowflakes. They're all the random, <laughs> we say, uh, expression of form. They are all beautifully, in one sense, um, themselves, but they are also fractal. So as you go down the stem, you see further expressions which are of the overall nature of the whole um, snowflake. And this is fractality, which is another expression of difference in unity. So there is a unity, and as you go down into it and things differentiate, they become more and more versions of the same thing in the way that um, beautiful things often have this asymmetry built into them. Um, I mentioned the... Uh, um, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, <laughs> Uh, the golden ratio. Um, but here is a, an example, so many of them from Japanese art, where there is both symmetry and asymmetry. And get this, it's not just asymmetry that matters. It's the asymmetry of symmetry with asymmetry. Look at that. In a way, it is symmetrical, but in an important way, it's also asymmetrical. And it's the coming together of these two opposites that creates beauty. This is very profound in beauty. Here, here is um, Palladio's villa, the Villa Capra, now known as the Villa Rotonda, um, uh, in, in the region of Vicenza, Padua. Uh, and you see that in this, in some ways, very formally perfect symmetrical facade, there are little signs of, of life. There are these figures that, this is a very strange 
thing I've got hold of, these figures that are living and asymmetrical. And here there is a goat, which was the family, the coat of arms of the Capra family. And so it has a sense of the beautiful symmetry, but complemented by asymmetry. Now look at this, which is a copy of it, basically, built at the University of Virginia by Thomas Jefferson, who was a not inconsiderable architect. It's just symmetrical. I had to put that in. <laughs> because there's asymmetry and symmetry and the asymmetry of symmetry and asymmetry. So something about sameness and difference is very important. We don't just want difference or sameness, but they're both together. And this is from Goethe, from his Fadenlehrer. Dividing the united, uniting the divided is the very life of nature. This is the eternal systole and diastole, the eternal coalescence and separation, the inhalation and exhalation of the world in which we live and where our existence is woven. And um, systole and diastole are the two beats of the heart. Systole is the, the lup and diastole is the dup of relaxation. Now, uh, just to finish on physics, I wanted to quote Pasteur, who, of course, was a biologist. The universe as a whole is asymmetrical, and I've come to believe that life, as it is manifest to us, is a function of the asymmetry of the, oh, hello, <laughs> the asymmetry of the universe. I would even say that living species are primordially in their structure, in their external forms, functions of the cosmic asymmetry from his inaugural lecture in 1854 at Lille. And here, um, some 40 years later, is Pierre Curie, of course, a great physicist. Certain elements of symmetry may coexist with certain phenomena, but they're not necessary. What is necessary is that certain elements of symmetry do not exist. It is asymmetry which creates the phenomenon. The effects produced may be more symmetrical than the causes. And I just put this here. Uh, in 1956, um, this Chinese lady made this discovery of the um, violation of parity, which means the left and right hand are not symmetrical. In the case of the weak interaction, all the other forces that have been discovered were symmetrical. But then she discovered this is asymmetrical. And I'm sorry to report to you that um, about three or four years later, two men got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. <laughs> there we are. Now, what has this got to do with the world we live in? I'm going to do this very quickly. You'll be glad to know. I believe that over the course of uh, the history of the West, we've gone through phases. In the Greek civilization, there was a sudden efflorescence of everything, of the arts, of the sciences together. And then in the Roman world, there was something similar. And in each of those cases, it tailed off over three or 400 years and that civilization disappeared. And then again, in our age, the sudden eruption of wonderful working together of the right and left hemisphere, which are both necessary for science. In fact, the more important one is the right hemisphere. So don't ever quote me as saying the left hemisphere is science and the right hemisphere is the arts. We need both for both. And in both cases, the right hemisphere asymmetrically is more important than the left even in science. I believe that in our world, like those worlds in which I've, I've shown in the second part of the Master and his emissary, that things have drifted further and further to the left hemisphere point of view. It's happening to us now. Now, if I'm right, let's do, the, let's do a, a kind of um, little um, fantasy. Let's imagine that actually the left hemisphere was the only one we were listening to. What would the world look like? Well, there'll be a loss of the broader picture. Knowledge would be replaced by informations, tokens, or representations of true understanding. Wisdom wouldn't get anywhere near it because wisdom is much too unmeasurable. The product of a properly lived human life has nothing there that the left hemisphere can get hold of. Can't be operationalized. There'll be the loss of the concepts, therefore, of skill and judgment, which are essential to being a fully functioning human being. 
they'd all be taken over by machines that had algorithms and things like that. So we'd spend hours talking to machines and getting nowhere instead of talking to people who would exercise skill and judgment. I'd hate to live in that world. And there'll be simultaneous abstraction and reification. So one and the same time, things would become more and more abstract. The stuff you read would have more and more abstract nouns in it, wouldn't refer to reality. At the same time, matter would become just lump and matter. I always say that materialists are not people who overvalue matter, but undervalue matter, because matter is very, very special. Even if you believe there is only matter, then you've got to accept that matter gave rise to Bach St. John passion. So it's pretty amazing stuff. Bureaucracy would have a field day, because according to Peter Berger, a great sociologist, these are the characteristics of bureaucracy. Um, I, I'll let you read them. And the mere loss of the sense of uniqueness, just categories. On those things you had to fill out which box. There's never a box for me. But wait a minute, with whom? On which day? In what circumstances? You know, and in what mood? Um, quantity would become the only criteria, not quality. There'd be a sort of either orness. No, you can't have, well, it might be this, it might be that. You've got to go, yes, it's this, or yes, it's that. Um, Reasonableness would be replaced by pure ratiocination, which is not the same thing. In German, there's a distinction, as you know, the German speakers here between Vernunft and Verstand. And we don't have this distinction in English. So I make the distinction between reason, which is an embodied thing that comes with experience and being able to think clearly, whereas uh, rationalization is just the, the application of logical rules. There'll be a failure of what we call common sense, and is now extremely uncommon. There'll be systems designed simply to maximize utility, loss of social cohesion, depersonalization, paranoia, and lack of trust because the left hemisphere wants to control. Its only power is control. So if it thinks things are slipping out of control, it's not thinking, how can I control them better? We need more cameras. We need perhaps a, a database. Yes, let's have a database of the genomes of the population. Um, there'd be a need, in other words, for total control. And anger and aggression would be the it would be the term of our conversations. People think the bad old days used to say, oh, the left hemisphere is down to earth, reliable, but not emotional. Whereas the right hemisphere is a bit given to moods, you know, that's terrible. But actually the emotion that most strongly lateralizes of all emotions is anger and it lateralizes to the left hemisphere, not to the right. And we, we would, you remember how when something doesn't work, oh, it's nothing to do with me. I can't be responsible. You remember that? Well, we would be the passive victims of other people's doings, never a problem with us. And in this world, art would become purely conceptual. It would have um, uh, uh, lacking a sense of depth and bizarre perspectives. These are things that only the, the right hemisphere can fully understand and therefore came into being three times in Greece, in Rome. It wasn't just invented in Florence in 1453. It was invented serially and then lost as civilization decayed because it's how the right hemisphere sees depth in the world, not just the screen in front of it. Music would produce a little more than rhythm because that's the only bit the left hemisphere gets. The complexities of melody and harmony are interpreted uh, by the right hemisphere. There is a distinction in professional musicians who train their brains specially, but that's the norm. And language would become, I hope not too much like mine, diffuse, successive, lacking in concrete reference. There'd be a deliberate undercutting of the sense of awe or wonder, because what does that mean? It just means you, don't, you haven't done enough research yet. Of course we understand everything. One more experiment and we really have got it. But actually to be fully present in the world and to understand it and to be appreciative of it with gratitude, which is the secret of a fulfilling and happy life. We need to be able to rediscover the sense of awe or wonder. And flow would just become an infinite series of pieces like a goods train. There'll be discarding of all tacit forms of knowing, everything having to be explicit, network of small complicated rules strangling us. This is what the Tocqueville saw in America in 1837. That was a very prescient man. And we would be like um, Descartes, uh, proudly calling ourselves spectators rather than actors in the world, sitting on the sofa with a six pack, watching it all go by on the telly. 
Um, and all this would be accompanied by a dangerously unwarranted optimism. Well, thank goodness we don't live in that world. So just my last words, values. Shayla created this pyramid of values. And I say these are the only ones that we now respect, the values of utility and pleasure. All the other ones, what he meant by Lebenswerte was courage, magnanimity, um, fidelity, generosity. All of that seems to be the sort of thing that nowadays only suckers do that and other people profit from it. So why would you do that? Why don't just be a dog that eats dog? Values of the intellect, Geistige Werte, of course, you know that Geist means both mind and soul. These would be things like beauty, goodness, and truth, the Platonic virtues. And at the top is das Heilige, the holy. And I believe we have inverted this. So in our left hemisphere world, the holy is just a fiction that enables certain priests to have power. The values of the intellect are really just to do with sexual selection. The values of vitality, as I say, are those um, espoused by people who don't know any better. And thank God they do, because we can take advantage of them. And really, it's all in the service of use and pleasure. We'll, uh, we live in an upside down world, my friends. This is where we are now. We've lost value. We have a lust for the power to manipulate, which is the left hemisphere's uh, uh, raison d'etre. We seem to have lost any sense of purpose because we think of purpose in a utilitarian way. Like the purpose of a, of a, of a, a, copy, of a copying machine is to... Um, purpose of a copying machine is to produce a copy. Um, and... <laughs> Whereas we have a purpose, even when it's not a utilitarian purpose. Um, and lastly, uh, there's a blurring of boundaries between truth and falsehood now. Um, there's a war on truth, basically, all around us, from politicians and from various sectors of society, which is that of uh, bureaucracy and AI, turning everything that is living into a series of processes and I, I can talk, as you can well imagine, for a very great deal of time about those and have done on other occasions that I'm not going to do now. Thank you.